I would like to thank <laughs> Ramesh for the entire team supporting us find a new home for the, the, the uh, MEG. So the, uh, I want to share with you some of the new features for the brand new MEG we have and also the, uh, the nice performance of our magnetic shielding room. And also uh, I will share some new policies and also something uh, important for uh, the PIs may use our MEG for research and the, the scan rate. So let's get started. And so we know the MEG and uh, it's a functional uh, imaging technology, it's non-invasive, and uh, it's a nice combination of one meter second temporal resolution in time and two to three millimeter spatial resolution. Here's where the MEG signal come from. MEG is come from the, uh, the it's neuronal current from the dendrite. And so like EEG, we are insensitive to the, you know, to the action potential happening in the white matter. Instead, MEG, we're measuring the dendrite current from the gray matter. If you take a look of this coronal cut over here, this tiny square over here, you zoom in, the different uh, layer of neurons, you know, one, three, four, five, six. And the neurons, you know, and the layer on the four to six, they have the big cell called the primitive cell that lined up beautifully in parallel, a lot of signal summation. So we are measuring the uh, group of neurons in the population of a few hundred thousand neurons when they're firing synchronously and generate measurable MEG signal. When neural current are firing, they generate MEG field can penetrate different head tissue with no distortion. And uh, by placing the MEG sensor outside the head, uh, like this, we can perform non-invasive MEG measurements. Here's the, the MEG sensor you know, we have on the ER machine. And each chip have three sensors, totally 102 chips, totally 306 sensors. A specific time, in this case, in the auditory you know, and the response, we can measure the field you know, and the uh, topography with MEG sensors. And then by solving the MEG forward uh, inverse problem, we generate source imaging, the hotspot over here. And we can super you know, impose on the, uh, uh, the anatomy we get from the MR. So um, when we look at the, the MEG, the MEG signal is extremely weak. We'll talk about one billionth in, of the Earth's field. To, take, to make the energy signal measurable, we place the energy scanner inside this big box called the magnetic shielding room. This is the shielding room built by a, a medical and you know the three engineer over here. And it's a, only the three the room available. Only we have a six layer shielding. You know, three layers mu metal, three layers you know an aluminum with gold coating. You know, you know after this uh, symposium, they take a look you know at our facility, and we had to tear apart and the shielding room in the old side. Uh, into modules, and, and when I come over here and the QI, we reset up. There's a three engineer coming here, reset up this, this big, you know, 26 metric tons shooting room at the QI. And uh, notice the place is not there and at the first place. So Ramesh and the team had allowed us to knock down a whole bunch of drywall to make the space for us. And so uh, here's the, you know, the uh, reconstructed sh sh shooting room. There's a door. The door and also the shooting room is two feet and thick X, Y, Z, so 26 metric tons. And what the chart on the right-hand side shows actually the shooting factor. And three color is the uh, orientation X, Y, and Z. And, the, and at 0.1 hertz, the shooting factor is right, just right below 70, 70 dB. It's, it's one million. That's, that's amazing, the shooting factor from the, the, the shooting room. At the one hertz, it's a little bit lower than 90, uh, 90 dB. And the, the, the great crosses are the shooting factor average together across three in orientation at the old side. So you can see for vast majority of the curve, the performance of the shooting room on the new side even better than the old side. Of course, you know, at the very end, the high frequency one, there's a little bit worse because the, uh, uh, and some of the high frequency components you know, are actually <laughs> deteriorating. But for the most part, actually, the performance of the shooting room is amazing. That probably is one of the best room you know, in the whole world for MEG. There are only three, you know, one in uh, uh, MGH in Harvard and Boston, second over there, the third one somewhere in Europe. So if you want to do some, not an MEG, when you use this room for low magnetic you know, and field environment, the room is ideal for you. And with this room, we can also you know, have the brand new MEG machine. Rolling to mention we have S10 gram from NIH, the fundamental part of this uh, MEG uh, system, and called the uh, Trax Neo. Uh, Neo. And this is the timeline from the manufacturer, Megan, and also in line with my entire career. So 
They have the first, first Hohan MEG system, 122 channels. The first one in the US is in Albuquerque VA. And uh, you know, so Roland and I, we, we, were, we were there using the machine to perform in the MEG clinical and research and uh, acquisition. And 2005, we moved to uh, 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 San Diego. So we have the, the next generation, the one from uh, McGinn, uh, called VectorView, 306 sensors. And then to make some progress, and make the sensor actually better, and uh, also make the system narrower in, the, in 2011. And major breakthrough happening in 2015. They, they have the, this 100% the in you know, a helium liquefier and recycle system 2015. Uh, and by to, uh, 2019, they have the Trex Neo, and that one actually the major sensor more robust. So before, it's easy to trap flux. If you're working in, in a room with a cell phone or something like that, the sensor may get saturated, but the new generation, you know, was, you know, and the, uh, uh, the, the build, you know, and uh, uh, Trex Neo don't have that issue. So we have a 100% helium recycler and also, a, you know, on the new set of sensors. And the good thing about it, and this new machine compared with the old machine we have in 2005, the geometry of the sensor is identical. So, you know, so we can actually pull the old data with any new data we collect, you know, if you have an ongoing project, you know, merging the data would be quite, you know, would be quite easy. And so here's the, uh, the new machine we have, you know, a multiple gantry position, and at the supine position, that's the one for epilepsy, page come over here, take a nap, and also have a supine potential over here, you know, all the research project going on, and, uh, and uh, 306 sensors. In addition to that, we also can have a simultaneous 122 EEG channel on top of that, and we also have EOG, ECG, EMG, all the other channels, uh, as I mentioned. One major important feature is 100% recycling rate for the helium. The helium cost shooting up to the sky, you know, before, you know, our you know, operational cost that keep the machine cooling down every year is 100K US <laughs> dollar. Uh, you know, with this 100% recycling rate, we only need to refill the helium once a year during this uh, annual maintenance. So it's, it's amazing, you know, and money saving for us, you know, with that, uh, you know, that feature. And I will show you some of the data we collect, you know, uh, uh, last week or the, the week before. This is, you know, median nerve test. And, uh, uh, dry median nerve, uh, nerve test, there's a 306 sensors show over here. The, the left side, the spike over there is T equals zero. That's the, the, the shock, the, the, the electro, you know, that's, that's artifact, you know. Uh, but the vast majority signal is the contralateral hemisphere and the left hemisphere over here. If you look at one of the channel over here, point over here, at 20 milliseconds after shock, you have this very nice, you know, primary central cortex light up and uh, in the parietal lobe. And uh, if you look at Later on, 85 millisecond, then the topography change. Look at have two sources, left and right. They're called the secondary you know, sensory cortex. The amazing part is the, the signal noise ratio is just simply amazing. You can see the flat baseline and you know, was very, very nice, you know, and the uh, signal to noise ratio. And now we can go from the central domain into the brain by solving the MEG uh, uh, inverse problem. It shows over here in the movies, you know, we see the signal come from primary central cortex first, and then relay to the secondary central cortex in S2 over here, from S1 over here to S2. This one superimposed on the uh, uh, MR, you know, with infinite brain, we get from free surfer. You can also superimpose the MEG hotspot and the traditional MR, you can see the primary central cortex and over here, and bilateral secondary, you know, S2 over here. The right-hand side is the picture I get from the our favorite textbook, you know, principal neuroscience from uh, Kendall Schwartz. And, and that chapter, when you look at the human central cortex, uh, you see that the signal of travel from peripheral nerve, you know, spinal cord, rich thalamus, and then projection to the primary central cortex, area 3B, area 1, area 2. And then area 1 to 3, send the signal back to S2 area. The S2 is physically at the end of central sulcus over here. So, but if you, if you look at the, the, the reference over there in, in that chapter, most knowledge, even though it's human you know, in the picture, but most knowledge we get from non-human primate, monkeys and so on. But right now, you can get the same information, potentially more, non-invasively, on the living human being with, uh, with MEG, with a millisecond and temporal resolution to the three millimeter uh, spatial accuracy. Because you know, 3B and ever 2 they're next to each other, but MEG have no problem resolve those ones. 
So in the, um, and also that's another example we have paper published. You know, we used MEG for, you know, for language localization. Here's the simple task with picture naming, the subjects name a crocodile, airplane, baby, and apple. So we, we, we targeted you know, this task to localize the primary you know, language production area, the broken area. And this is a 10 patient with brain tumor, some tumor so, so big, you can see this tumor, giant tumor over here and over here. So the first A subject, you know, the left hemisphere, you know, broken ear light up by the, the green arrow. The resolution is, is just superb, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and that's what, you know, Burka called, you know, well, we humans speak with the left hemisphere. Uh, but for, for lefties, the story is a little bit different. The last two, you know, patients, they are lefty, you know, you know, one of them is bilateral, both left and right, you know, and Burka's ear, you know, light up for this test. The last one, uh, lefty, and the language dominant area for uh, language production is right hemisphere, the, the right broadcast area light up. Yeah, but the resolution is very, really nice. And we can also do group analysis. Here's the, the resting state, you know, and the eyes closed. And the first resting state recording, and it's, by, it's done by almost 100 years ago, by, you know, and the, the Hansberg used EEG, the place electro and the parietal lobe. And the, the measure, you know, the pop up of beautiful 10 hertz, you know, an oscillation, they call it, you know, the alpha wave. And, but for, for, for decades, we have the pieces, of, you know, in, in, in the, uh, the puzzle, and, but, you know, people you know, open the skull, put the electro grid on, on the cortex, and we know that the alpha wave mainly come from the occipital lobe, or parietal lobe, but now you can do that non-invasively with MEG. Here's the, the study we did in, in 41 healthy control subjects, of course, for a group analysis with smooth owls and the, the sources, you know, and the register in a standard template. And uh, now you can see the alpha wave, the 10 hertz. Indeed, the vast majority is taken from the occipital lobe and from primary central and uh, visual cortex and the secondary uh, visual cortex even have a gap over there. You can separate those two. Uh, from cuneus, precuneus, and parietal lobe, and two hot spots over there in the central motor cortex for the hands. And uh, I skipped the second one and focus on the, the third one, which is gamma band signal. You can see that the, the, the energy is totally different. There's a less signal from the, from the parietal and the occipital region. Instead, the prefrontal prefer cortex light up beautifully. So that can allow us to have the tool to look at a lot of, uh, you know, and the patient with, you know, mental illness. You look at the, with mild TBI, with PTSD, uh, with gamma band as another, you know, and the biomarker. So, and, uh, so the, the opportunity is fantastic, you know, and uh, so one thing I think many PIs may be interested in is our policy and, and, and rate. So we offer, you know, the standard rate, if your project's funded by NIH and VA you know, with the budget, you know, scan budget already built in, we charge $510 per hour. That's in the low end compared with other MEG centers. They are in the upper 500, even some, some centers charge over $600 per hour. Even better, for if you want, want to try to run some pilot projects, you know, get some pilot data for your next you know, NIH R1 VA merit, we offer a huge discount. We offer you know, $250 per hour. Of course, you know, uh, we don't want you, you to opt to, uh, to you, to scan the, with this rate for say 20, 30 subjects, that's too much. And so we limit you know, up to six subjects. I think that's sufficient for you to get pilot data for your next R1 and VA merit. And uh, if you're only interested in using the, the shooting room without the MEG, and the rate also is quite nice, we offer $250 per hour. And for those people, actually the, the junior faculties, and you know, don't have any funding, you know, so we offer them an even further discount for people actually applying for a K award, the VA, you know, the CAD, the Career Development Award, and so on. Please contact us. We, we, further, we offer even further uh, discount for you. And so we are over here to serve you. And, uh, and you can send me, you know, on the email. We can set up a Zoom meeting. We, I'll be go, go through with your design and help you, you know, migrate and your, your, your protocol to the MEG system and help you collect some pilot data. And, and if I had an ongoing project, that'd be great. MEG is, is open for, for business, for both clinical and research. So I stop there and thank you so much. <laughs>